Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the uh, 2022 seminar series. Today's topic is navigating the tsunami of collaborative contract models. Uh, we're going to be joined today by uh, none other than obviously TCA's president, John Mollenhauer, and he will be uh, steering the question and answer period. A little bit of housekeeping for that. Please uh, keep your questions to the end and use your question, uh, use the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. Our speakers today, uh, Brian Maximitz from Graham Construction, civil engineer with over 25 years experience. He's got quite a storied past with uh, a variety of positions being held, uh, the owner, the engineering design, and then the constructor in both public and private sectors uh, with a real focus on municipal and industrial water treatment. He's an expert in project procurement contract models and works as a director of project development with Graham's Civil Infrastructure Division in Calgary. Joining Brian will be uh, Andrew Hill. Andrew has overseen Graham's building operations in Ontario for the last four years. Uh, he has 28 years of construction experience working throughout the UK and France before joining Graham in Canada in 2013. Originally starting his life out as a steel erector, he's moved through a variety of roles from field engineer, site manager, project manager, operations manager, and today the vice president of operations. The final speaker is Natalie Kloss, and Natalie is a professional engineer with 25 years experience in both the private and public sectors in project de uh, development. Natalie has managed a variety of power, industrial, healthcare, and infrastructure projects across Canada. She joined Graham in 2015 in Vancouver, BC overseeing Graham's P3 portfolio post financial close. In 2019, Natalie moved to Toronto as Graham's new district manager for its infrastructure, water, and transportation businesses in Ontario. With that, I'll hand the, uh, the, the mic over to the folks from Graham and they'll get you started. Hi, good morning, everybody. It's Brian Maximitz from Graham, and uh, I have the title slide up there. Uh, navigating the tsunami of collaborative contract models. So two comments on this. Uh, the first one is um, my background and, and the work that I do for Graham is, is focused in the infrastructure sector. And you'll hear me today refer to civil infrastructure projects, transportation and, uh, and, and water is kind of where I spend my time. And, and we have Natalie and, uh, and uh, Andrew on the phone to kind of help uh, bring in the buildings perspective. Natalie runs our infrastructure group, but she'll bring, she'll help bring in the buildings perspective with uh, the building sector perspective with Andrew. And the other thing is you can see on the slide here, I have early contractor involvement in brackets. And the reason is, is because collaborative contract models is interchangeable in our world with early contractor involvement, because the main thing that's changing is we're getting the contractor involved earlier in the work that the designer and the, uh, owner are doing together. And so you will hear me mostly refer to ECI today or early contractor involvement. And you should understand that that's interchangeable with uh, collaborative uh, contract models. So uh, here's our mug shots. And I just wanted to thank uh, Matt Staten, uh, president of SG Constructors. Matt is also on the board of the Toronto Construction Association. So thanks for the introduction. And John Mollenhauer is responsible for getting us on the panel today. We really appreciate being part of the 2022 seminar series. And I uh, really want to thank John for that. And, and Susanna and Vishon have uh, been very helpful in getting us set up for today's seminar. So the way we're going to do it is I'm going to do the first half of the presentation and uh, Andrew and Natalie are going to provide color commentary where I leave something out. They'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll jump in. And uh, then when we start talking about, here's the agenda. When we start talking about uh, some ECI contract models explained or some, as I said, some collaborative contract models explained, uh, Andrew and uh, Natalie are going to lead that part of the discussion. And then we'll wrap up today with uh, some procurement tips. Um, Qualifications based selection is involved with, uh, with early contractor involvement and, and we'll, we'll get into that. So just two slides on Graham. We are a four and a half billion dollar construction company, kind of top three in Canada. And uh, that is with the recent acquisition of a buildings company in, the, in California and an industrial company in, in Canada. Uh, that does maintenance. And you can see the sectors we're in, buildings, infrastructure, industrial, and development, uh, which is our kind of our P3. We also do real estate development uh, here at Graham. And the office location is kind of shown on the North American map. There's roughly 20 offices. 
And as I said, the new additions are the California cluster and uh, their offices in, in Colorado. Uh, so that's who we are and, and where we do things. And you can see it's, you know, 50% of the business is in Western Canada, 25% of our business is in Ontario and 25% of our business is in, in the US. So why should we be discussing contract models? Um, I think we all have heard, you know, there's too much risk transfer. So we'll just categorize it as, as poor risk transfer to contractors. And as you'll see today, it's actually poor risk communications, which is really what the problem is. Uh, some of these contract models uh, that we've been used to using the bid build and the design build, they're actually seeping value instead of creating value. And, and we want to turn that around. And in our world, you know, working at a, at a general contractor, we're, we're just, we just see so much transactional procurement behaviors. And part of the conversation is about how, how we're communicating between the owner and the bidder and the designer uh, during the procurement stage. So it's not just the execution where you need the improved contract model. It's also uh, during the procurement. Uh, so in general, contractors are kind of missing from the dialogue. There's a lot of uh, engineering consultants and management consultants uh, leading the discussion and uh, it's it's a great opportunity for Graham to come on online today with our true partner culture and and kind of help to share uh, shed a little bit of light on on the issues from a contractor perspective and explain the mechanics of collaboration and uh, procurement of ECI or collaborative contract models and and one of the main conclusions we're going to make today is that it's not one size fits all and so we want to turn down the sparkle of this model or that model uh, last year it was uh, last year it was uh, integrated project delivery that was this bright shining light and this year it's alliance and next year it'll be something else and everybody kind of gravitates to that and says maybe we should be doing this simple sewer project with an alliance and it's uh, you know, it's, uh, you'll, you'll learn today why that's not, it's kind of overkill in some instances. And so a key message is um, that choose the right model for the right project. Um, and so just as an introduction to early contractor involvement, it's not a contract model itself. A collaborative contract model is not a, is not a contract model itself. It's a philosophy. And we like to think of it as an umbrella and underneath the umbrella, there's a variety of contract models for different situations. And as I said, it's not one size fits all for your organization. It's use the right model for the right job. And you should also keep in mind that the owner's cost of using any contract model, and I have a typo there, and the, the owner's cost of using any contract model should provide a return on investment. So if you spend an extra million dollars hiring a contractor to get involved with your team, what value was created? And can you show that, you know, we, yeah, finance department, we spent a million dollars extra, but we, we generated $10 million in savings. And so you should be able to demonstrate that based on uh, the outcomes of your project. So this is one of my favorite books that I recommend to everybody. And it's got an unfortunate title because it's, it's applicable to buildings, projects, and, and civil infrastructure projects, not just industrial. And it's not just about mega projects. It works for small projects and medium projects. It's a good read. Believe it or not, the book's almost 20 years old. Uh, but one of the main conclusions of the book is that the reason collaborative contract models result in better project outcomes is because you have true three-party collaboration and you have it earlier in the project. And of course, the three parties that we're talking about are the owner, the designer and the construction contractor. So we'll use this diagram to kind of explain collaborative contract models, the mechanics of why it works. And this is a, this is a, you know, some of you refer to it as a project cost and influence diagram. On the left hand access is the ability to influence the outcome of the project. And on the bottom is the project schedule uh, from start to finish. And uh, you know, your, your ability to influence the outcome, whether the outcome is quality or the outcome is safety, or in this case, the outcome is going to be computer com, com, cumulative project cost on the right hand axis from zero to 100%. This is kind of what a S curve looks like on an expenditure on a typical project. Um, your ability to influence that cumulative project cost is highest at the start of the project as you make the big decisions and it declines. Uh, you know, as you spend more money and, and then the cost of change as you move up or down the blue line, the cost of change is actually higher. You have less influence and you got to move that many more moving pieces to uh, 
to implement some change. And on the bottom, what we've added here is the typical phases of a project and each, you know, the building sector calls it something a little bit different than the civil infrastructure sector, but we've got kind of feasibility phase, preliminary design, detailed design. And in some cases you'll have long lead equipment depending what you're building and then construction and startup and turnover. Looking at that as the five phases and we apply, we extend those up into the, into the cost and influence diagram. And in a design bid build situation, as you can see, the owner and the designer collaborate, collaborate um, up until the tender is issued or the RFP for, for uh, construction procurement. And then the contractor gets involved. And what you see there is that the owner and the designer work together through those three phases of the project. And then the contractor gets involved. And we've all heard of those situations where the contractor says, I wish you would have gotten me involved earlier because we could have, done this a different way, a more efficient way or an easier way to build it. And you can see on the curve, what's been highlighted is this area of feasibility and pre-design where the contractor wasn't involved. That yellow could actually also extend out to the start of the construction phase. The contractor is not involved and yet that's the time during the project where you had the highest ability to influence the outcome and you're making key decisions like type of, type of facility, the redundancy of the facility, um, you know, different key decisions that are made earlier in the project and uh, you're missing one of the parties from making that decision. And so when we think about design build, which I know a lot of people are familiar with because like bid build, we've been using it for, you know, a generation at least. In design build, here again, the owner and the owner's engineer or the designer, they, they spend a lot of effort uh, building up a 30% uh, specification, very voluminous documents, you know, about every need and want that the client might have for their project. And then they do 30% drawings and they issue those for bid in a three-party bid competition. And then it comes down to low cost. And then you turn it over to the design builder. And, and anyone who's been in one of these projects uh, knows that often the owner left something out of that 30% spec and they want the design builder to consider it or the first time they get insight into what the designer builder is coming up with, they say, oh, I'd like it a little bit differently. The design builder has their marching orders. They don't want to be derailed or taken off course from their productivity and production. And they often say to the owner, listen, we've got the job. We know what we need to do. We don't need the owner's involvement. You've told us clearly what you want. And then the design builder continues on without the involvement of the owner. And again, during that period when the owner and the owner's engineer made all the critical decisions, influencing the cumulative project cost earlier in the job, the, the contractor, the construction contractor on that design build team and the designer there, they were not involved with those key decisions. And so in early contractor involvement, and again, it's an umbrella of contract models, all three parties are involved from as early as possible at the start of the project, the owner, the designer, and the contractor. And this enables true three-party collaboration during the period of highest influence. This opportunity is missed with design, bid, build, and, and design, build, which is by far the the, the main way that projects are tendered these days is, is design, bid, build, or design, build. So that's the mechanics of uh, collaborative contract models and why they work and how they work, and also referred to as early construction involvement. And so Natalie was going to comment here on, on the example we just covered and summarize what I, what I said. Yeah, so thanks, Brian. So this slide really summarizes the pros and cons of using the design, build uh, model. So. As Brian mentioned, you know, it does bring the designer and the contractor onto the same team and they're involved early in the project, but just not early enough to really influence some of the cost decisions that will be made on the project. And so that brings us over to the, the cons. This design build bid package that will come out is expensive, you know, initiates expensive procurement. Generally, you have three design teams with three different contractors looking at the project. With an honorarium, you have an owner's engineer that's done the design, the 30%, up to 30% design previously. So it does become expensive for the owners. As Brian mentioned, you, you're working towards a spec. The processes are a little bit more rigid. You have RFIs and commercially confidential meetings. And that collaboration does just never, doesn't exist on these projects. Or it does exist between various parties, but not the three critical parties at the early stage of the project. So um, yeah, 
I think Thanks, that's Natalie. It, yeah. And I'll, I'll explain what Natalie was talking about, about the uh, RFI process and the, the confidentially commercial meetings. For anyone who's been in a CCM, you know not much gets accomplished because there's very little that you're allowed to talk about. Um, but in the RFI situation shown here on the left, this is uh, project procurement communications without a collaborative contract model, without early contractor involvement. And so the uh, contractor in the top left-hand corner fires off an RFI to the owner sitting at their computer and uh, they'll send back an email. And often, you know, when you're in the co contractor's office, you get responses like, uh, well, the, the kind of mechanics, the kind of experience that happens is the owner, I don't understand why the contractor's asking this question. And then they fire back the answer that says, please refer to the specifications. And the contractor says, I don't think they understand why we asked the question. And the contractor never explains why they're asking the question. Then you got this circle of really inefficient communications where often questions don't get answered and please refer to the specifications. And it's a little bit uh, inefficient in terms of, when you think about wanting to address uh, risk, especially. Over on the right-hand side, we have procurement communications with collaborative contract models or with early contractor involvement where you have everybody sitting around the table. You got the contractors people and you got the owners people and you got the designers people and you're co-located and you're, you're sitting in the same office on a day-to-day -day basis. You're getting to know each other and a team culture is forming where what happens is us and them kind of becomes we instead of us and them. It's we are building, we are designing and building this project. And sitting around the table, you're able to discuss scope, risk, and price. You're able to uh, negotiate scope, risk, and price around the table on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis and really bring some innovation uh, through collaboration to bring down the cost of the project to, to define the scope better so the estimators know what they're pricing. And the risk discussion is all about uh, risk identification, what are the risks, uh, defining the options to deal with them, uh, evaluating the, the, uh, the cost contingency that could or should be carried with the risk, and then ultimately deciding who who should be paid to take that risk? Do you want the contractor to take it? Or Mr. Owner, this is a $5 million contingency we're putting in the bid. If you kept this risk, which is likely to materialize even if you give it to us, if you take this risk, uh, you save $5 million and you're gonna end up dealing with it anyways, even if you assign it to us, because it's one of those risks that requires multi-parties to address. And then the biggest part about risk when you're sitting around the table is, Although one party is getting paid to manage the risk, you have three parties who can actually collaborate to mitigate the risk. So all three people, all three parties can work together to mitigate the risk. And then when you're in this early contractor involvement uh, situation and uh, the design is unfolding and the, the contractor is building the project execution plan, you can also do things like, boy, we need some more geotechnical data or we need environmental or we need archeological. Um, or we need utilities data from the field. So you can do early field investigations. You can do early works to kind of de-risk the project and eliminate some of that risk contingency that the contractor was gonna price into the, into the bid. You can deal with your stakeholder management. Often the contractor is missing from the stakeholder management conversations and then the owner makes a lot of commitments about what the team is gonna do. And often those commitments that are made to the stakeholders are not passed on to the contractor in the spec. And now you have a, now you have a, now you have a gap where the contractor is asking for additional compensation to deal with some promise that somebody made to a stakeholder. So day-to-day uh, -day problem solving and innovation as we discussed. So all of these, it's, we talk about collaborative contract models and we think about it in the execution phase, but it's actually that collaboration during the design and planning of the project where the biggest value creation takes place. And so it's, it's about how we treat each other and how we, how we communicate with each other. So to summarize the benefits to an owner, and this presentation is kind of focused for owners, um, to summarize the benefits to the owner with an ECI model, it's, as we said, the early three-party collaboration during the period of highest influence, improved communications. All funds are directed into one version of the design instead of into managing a design competition. So that applies to design build. Often the owner knows what they want. So why are they hiring three companies to rack their brains out trying to interpret this specification about yay big and these 30% drawings? Why are they spending all that money like, and then the lawyer fees and the procurement fees and the advisor fees and, the, and the, all the other people that are involved in that pricey procurement? Why not just take all that money and put it into one version of the design? 
Uh, the owner has trans transparency into the abilities of the contractor before moving to the field. And if the owner says, I'm not comfortable with you folks, you haven't given me the A team for the collaborative phase and you're not adding any value and, and you're, uh, you know, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not improving this project, then they can take the off ramp and say, I'm going to take all the work we've done and I'm going to tender it. And hopefully the owner has time in his schedule to actually go and let that tender happen. So better decision making with real world definition when you have the contractor in the room to help the designer generate the options and have the construction people uh, provide more accurate cost estimating. The more accurate cost estimating which constructors can provide in an ECI environment comes around for three reasons. One is you got to agree on quantities and often the designers cost estimating people don't have a clear uh, look at the quantities. The second factor is um, the cost of temporary works. So often the designer in the engineering office knows what the end product looks like and they can price that, they can cost estimate that, but they don't know the means and methods the contractor will use to arrive at that final decision. So what is the cost of temporary works that's not in that uh, owner's or designer's cost estimate? And the third understanding is what risk contingency uh, will the contractor carry? And you get visibility into all those three things when you're in a collaborative environment, when you receive a bid or when you receive a design build bid, you don't get to know what risk contingency the bidder has put on certain elements of the project and the opportunity to collaboratively mitigate those risks has been missed. And so you're paying a premium on whatever the contractor thought was required in case the risk is, occurs on the job. <clears throat> so there's, there's a few other ones. I talked about continual joint ownership of the project, us and them becomes we. The planning, the construction contractor can do early execution planning, both to de-risk the project, which lowers the project, but it also helps them, item 11, it helps them to hit the ground running, faster uh, execution due to significant pre-planning and reduced learning curve on site compared to just mobilizing from a tender, a standard tender award. Early contractor field program we talked about, again, de-risking the project and saving money. A shorter procurement cycle for sure, because you just bring in that contractor and you get started and we're gonna work on one version of the project instead of a design competition, which can take six to nine months. Uh, the owner should always ask for open book cost estimating to see the, to see the buildups. Um, you know, you should be able to understand what profit the contractor is booking on the job and what overheads they're using, how they build up their labor rates. All those, you know, the owner makes the rules is one of, is he who holds the gold makes the rules is one of our uh, sayings. And we talked about the off ramp. So those are some of the benefits. And now we talk about the umbrella. And what I've got on this curve is uh, on the left hand axis is the important of end user input into the design or the level of effort that the owner team has to exert to manage the project or the level of cost the owner needs to spend to implement some of these uh, procurement models, these contract procurement models. And on the bottom is kind of the, some of the team behaviors going from responsive on the left-hand side in a bid build situation to a little bit more proactive when you get into construction management, progressive design build and CCGC design assist. And then all the way to visionary, you know, we wanna, we wanna do something incredible with this bridge or we wanna do something incredible with this uh, community sports complex. And, and those things get unlocked in the integrated project delivery and alliance, but they come with a cost. So you look at the bottom for the type of collaboration behaviors that you want to unlock in your project. And then you go back to how much effort is it going to take for us to do that? And, uh, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Um, what we say here is not just during execution, but also think about it during procurement. The bid build and design build have low collaboration during execution and during procurement, whereas it's high collaboration during those two project phases with the other models shown on this slide. And I did say at the start of the meeting that a model's cost should yield a return on investment. You should be able to prove to the finance department uh, the value that you created on the job by spending an extra million dollars or, or whatever it is. And so one of the key messages in today's presentation is that we don't have to reinvent the way our organizations do projects by going to integrated project delivery and alliance because a lot of the problems that occur on a project that make it run over budget or over schedule can be solved if we just improve, if we just tweak what we're already doing. So if you take bid build and tweak it, tweak it by getting the contract manager 
construction manager involved earlier, or if we take design build and optimize it by making it progressive design build, what we're doing is we're still respecting the fact that over the last 25 years, everybody's grown up doing projects a certain way, where if just fine tuning them a little bit without throwing out the baby with the bathwater and going to a brand new contract model. You know, when you get to integrated project delivery and alliance, one of the factors is it takes a real different mindset in the owner's team and in the contractor's team and in the in the designer's team to have this no blame culture and collaborate without fear of reprisals and, and risk trend. And it's just, it's really, uh, it takes a lot of effort going back to the left-hand side of this curve. And it takes a lot of cost because you're paying for a lot of people to be in the room during the, during the development of a project in IPD and Alliance. So if we just tweak what we're already doing here in the middle of the curve, lower cost, lower effort. And if you've solved those communication problems during procurement, you're going to fix you know, upwards of 90, 95% of the problems that occur on a project. And so that's one of our key messages today is that we don't have to reinvent the project wheel. And just as takeaways, I'm not going to talk about it today, but if you know what a framework agreement is where you have, you know, three or four contractors working on a portfolio of projects over a long term, you can use any of the models here inside of a framework. And one of our other key takeaways that we won't have time to talk about today is that you can use any of these models for project financing and we encourage owners to use post bid project financing as opposed to having the 90 days to close but those are subjects that if you want more information you can contact Andrew or Natalie and I and we can uh, explain that a little bit further and so uh, the message we've been giving is select the, the contract model that is right for your project and the way that you do that is you look at the risks on the project and what are the risks? What are the, what are the behaviors we need to manage those risks and what contract model unlocks those behaviors? That's, that's really how the decision-making goes to which, to which model to use. So I know that's a lot of information, but now we're going to dive into some of the contract models and I'm going to turn it over to Natalie and Andrew. Thanks, Brian. So I'll start with the design build model again. Um, you know, again, this is the mechanics of the design build. We're really starting with um, the owner and the owner's engineer developing a spec and drawings to bring it to about 30% and then going out for a long competitive process to usually three bidders um, using RFIs and CCMs throughout the procurement process to, uh, to go back and forth on the design and, the, and some of those items before selecting uh, the design builder to go ahead and build the project. And it is usually based on low price and the unsuccessful teams will receive an honorarium. So this is again, just a quick summary of some of the uh, pros and cons. Um, you know, it is a competitive process and the risk and there is risk transfer that is well-defined and it's generally a uh, risk transferred to the design builder. Uh, I think for the most part, we've talked about this, you know, it's an expensive process. Um, Contractors are involved in the early stages during pre 30% where there is the ability to influence the uh, cost of the project. And then the owner isn't as engaged during the design of the project after the uh, project is awarded. So the next slide is really there is there are projects that this model does make sense and photo in the background here is the Regina Bypass project. So it's a $1.4 billion P3 project that uh, Graham was part partnered with, uh, with that was constructed in Saskatchewan. Um, Greenfield project. Uh, scope was really well defined. It's uh, obviously working with the spec, a standard spec. Um, it was a good competitive process and they had the time. Um, Brian likes to say it's, you know, cutting a road through a farmer's field really so and these are the projects that design build makes sense is when there is a good scope and it's a greenfield project thanks Nelly, and uh, thanks brian always a hard man to follow uh construction management so you know what are the commercial attributes so or the mechanics uh, of the delivery so the owner has separate contracts with the designer uh and construction manager or CM, I'm going to refer to CM so I don't trip over my words. The CM is often uh, compensated as a percentage of the construction cost. And then we, you know, we, that may be flipped to a lump sum or a guaranteed maximum price you know, if, the, if the owner wishes to do so. 
the CA manages the procurement for subcontracts with the owner having full visibility and involvement throughout the process. And the CM may or may not wish to self-perform scope depending on the, the owner's requirements or wishes. Uh, I think an additional, uh, it's worth mentioning that predominantly there are, there are, there are obviously hybrids of, of, of this delivery strategy, but predominantly there are, there are two contract, uh, contract types, CCDC 5B and CCDC 5A. Uh, the 5B, commonly referred to as a CM at risk, uh, this is where, where the, the CM actually holds the contracts with the subtrades and then the CCDC 5A, the actual owner, holds, uh, holds those contracts with the subtrades and the CM uh, manages those contracts and, and acts as an agent for the owner in administering and, and overseeing. Uh, so next slide, I think, yep, positives. Uh, very good for fast track schedule driven projects, especially when the scope is loosely defined. You know, perhaps there are unknown conditions uh, that need to be explored or there's you know, potentially some delay in the design process for any particular reason. Uh, great transparency into the CM subcontract procurement. Uh, you know, in the past, uh, some of the CM work that we've done, you know, I've had owners and consultants in the closing room as we've, as we've sequentially tendered uh, packages. Uh, we've also, you know, worked in tandem with owners, you know, the owners that understand the key business requirements, you know, they want to be and need to be immersed in the, in the actual procurement process. Uh, good three-party collaboration, you know, with the owner, consultant, CM. Uh, fully aligned, uh, understand the owner's corporate governance, you know, aligned with the conditions of success uh, and the required project outcomes. But some of the negatives, um, sometimes, you know, CM fee as a, as a percentage of project cost can drive the wrong behaviours with the wrong contractors or the wrong individuals. Sometimes it's just a perception. Uh, and the projects can run over budget or, or you know, be delayed or run longer. Uh, particularly if the GCs that haven't been agreed to and fixed. Uh, it can be, you know, in contrast to, to the earlier positive, it also obviously can be difficult to align all the three parties, but you could say that about, about most, most delivery strategies. Um, and then the last point, owner's comfort level with a qualifications-based selection. And Brian's going to talk a little bit about that further on in the, uh, the presentation. Andrew, do you have any good examples of a construction where a CM model fits well? Uh, I would say, uh, that, well, you know, when, when, when it's difficult for the owner to, to define that project scope, like for example, I'll give you an example. Um, there's a recent project that we actually declined to, to bid on. I, 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 it was with a client that, uh, a repeat client that we've worked a lot with in the past. Uh, <clears throat> we were actually currently uh, constructing a project for them in a, in a hard, you know, bid, build uh, procurement. And, and, and another project came out uh, and we could, we could tell that the, the information, they didn't have the required information, the, draw, the, informa the drawings and specifications were a little bit, weren't there. Uh, so I spoke to the, uh, actually spoke to the client and said, look, look if we, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want this project, I don't really want to work in this manner because it's going to lead to, it's going to lead to many change orders and I don't want to ruin the relationship that we've got. So, you know, it, if you don't, if you don't, if there are a lot of unknowns or, 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 or for certain, you know, the, the project needs to be fast tracked, I think this is a fantastic uh, uh, delivery method. Thank you. And I'll point out the picture on the screen here behind the words. This is the Bonnie Book, Bonnie Brook Wastewater Treatment Plant in Calgary, kind of a 450 million liters per day facility. And they're adding 25% capacity, uh, both pro, uh, hydraulic capacity and process capacity uh, for sewage in Calgary. And the project is being delivered on a construction management model. Graham is the construction manager and it's a $700 million job. If you can, if you can imagine, and it's got 14 different projects inside the envelope and the city didn't know what's the optimal sequence. And there's a lot of issues with please do not disrupt the plant while it's operating, while you're doing your projects and a lot of seasonal coordination that's required. And the CM was to say, the CM model was chosen to say, we know what we need to do, but we don't really know the scope or the timing or the sequence. So we have our designer, let's bolt on a construction manager and get their constructability ideas, but more important, work out risk mitigation and operations coordination. And uh, it lends itself very well to that uh, project model. Yeah. So, so here it is here, yeah. Yeah, the sweet spot. Uh, 
you know, when it's, when it's difficult, as I said earlier, when it's difficult for the owner to define the project scope or when, where there's a need, you know, to fast track projects, you know, early design, sequential tendering of scopes. Um, you know, I'd say when not to use, uh, you know, again, as I mentioned earlier, when, when the, if the design has progressed to a point where, where it is robust and it is to the owner's requirements uh, and can be accurately, you know, and efficiently tendered um, within the time frame allowed, you know, where the C, basically where the CM cannot add any value at the early stages of the project. That's a great point about return on investment by going with the CM model. Um, I'll cover progressive design build. Some people are not familiar with this. It's more common in the United States, but in a progressive design build, it's, it's essentially a design build with the owner involved. And we talked about that situation where once it gets past 30% and you select your design builder, the owner really has trouble getting input into what the design builder is doing. So this is a design build with the owner involved. And the main difference about it is that the design build contractor is not hired through a three-party design competition. They're hired based on qualifications as early as possible in the development of the project to help with some of those big decisions, those big ticket decisions that really influence the outcome of the, pro the price. And it also works well where the owner knows what they want. And I think we find in most cases with water and wastewater treatment plant projects, especially the owner, they're very connected to their plants and they know what the problem is with their plant and they know what they want to fix. And they, they even know what processes they want to replace some of their processes with and, and to put them on the team. Uh, you know, what they often say is we just need a, someone to make the drawings and someone to meet code and somebody to build it. And they bring in a design builder in a, in a, progressive so it really lends itself to the water industry so the scope and risk management and open book pricing of the guaranteed maximum price are de developed progressively as the design unfolds and and the contractor is paid during that phase of the work and so uh, the pros on this model are that it's similar risk transfer and cost certainty as design build but you get the earlier involvement of the contractor to help add value uh, de-risk uh you know, early planning and all the things that will help bring down the price of the contract. And it's better use of owner funds because you're avoiding that costly procurement. Shorter, you could save six to 12 months off your project schedule by just hiring the design build contractor and getting started. And we talked about the collaboration. On the downside, and I think this is true for a lot of collaborative models, is that it requires mature staff from the owner's side. And what we mean by that is when you're in the, when you're in the collaborative environment, you need um, you need an owner's representative that's empowered to make decisions. And one of the things they do in in New Zealand is they have a, they have a, a collaborative facilitator who's kind of semi-retired person from the organization. They have the ear. They might have the ear of counsel, but they have the ear of the executives, and they're in the design team, they're in that collaborative three-party team, and they have the ability to reach back in the organization and quickly get approvals for $50 million decisions. And that's a, that's a pretty neat modification that they've made in New Zealand for these collaborative contract models. I, I forget the exact name that they call the position, but it's having that mature staff who can, who can make decisions on the spot because the contractors people are empowered to do it. The designers people are empowered to do it. And often it's the owners people that can't make the big ticket decisions. And then, you know, two days becomes two weeks becomes two months and the whole project is, is uh, grinding. Uh, so it requires mature staff. And also you need people to manage needs and wants uh, from the owner's team what is the difference between something you want and what is the difference between something you need? And often in a CM, as Andrew said, when that is not known, and even in a progressive design build, you know, group think can take over and you really need someone technically astute and operationally connected to the facility to help make some of those decisions. And again, another of the concern is uh, owner's comfort level with qualifications-based selection. So the sweet spot is kind of, as I said, projects with process performance risk transfer or projects that are influenced by operation and maintenance interests, not just cost, but interests. And good when the owner knows what they want and they need involvement in the design activities. So water treatment, uh, complex transportation, hospitals, uh, those sorts of things, and particularly strong for brownfield projects. Uh, the, the picture on the screen here, uh, you can't quite see it. There it is. This is the Buffalo Pound uh, potable water treatment plant in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. It serves the communities of Moose Jaw and the city of Regina under a joint ownership model that they have for that facility. 
and uh, the, the plant is 60 years old and it draws water from kind of a less than ideal water source and the owners know what needs to be fixed and all they wanted was please bring a design builder to help us achieve our goals and and uh, that's a project that Graham is working on the first progressive design build uh, water project in Canada and that's underway at this time they're still in the design development phase so the difference between progressive design build and what Graham likes to call design assist or in the United States it's called construction management general contractor what happens here is it's very similar to the progressive design build except the owner has a separate contract with the designer and with the owner and a common example of this one is similar to construction management is you have a designer and an owner kind of working on things and, and I always hear from clients they say boy I wish we had a contractor at the table to help make some of these decisions and so you bolt on a contractor to the existing team with a separate contract and the owner has separate contracts and then the 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 uh, contractor is paid for their their effort. And so you can imagine construction management, general contractor, what happens there is you hire that party on as a construction manager, and then you say, yes, we're happy with you. We wanna keep you as the general contractor. And then they get an, a contract extension. And the nuance in this model is that the procurement documents, you need some legal advice to avoid breaking the public procurement laws in the, in the public situation about um, sole sourcing a construction contract to somebody. So you do need a sound process where you lay out at the start of the selection process, you are not just competing for the, for the you know, uh, construction manager role or the, the CC with the city of Edmonton, CC stands for construction consultant, general contractor. The city of Edmonton says, you're not just applying for, to be the, the construction uh, consultant. You're also applying to be the general contractor and the city reserves the right to take an off ramp and not fill this scope. And so all of that is included in the procurement package originally so that you don't contravene those sole source, anti sole source uh, procurement laws. So the, 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 the pros is that the risk transfer can be similar to design build and progressive design build and it's true three party collaboration. The con is because the designer and builder aren't on the same team, the, the owner might need to referee. And the way that you really do that is put some teeth into your designer contract and your contractor contract at the beginning and really specify which party is responsible for what. And a good example is the contractor should be assigned the responsibility for the for the schedule of engineering, procurement and construction activities. Often the designer and the contractor in any project have their own schedules. And uh, it's the contractor who should lead the schedule in a, in, a, in a design assist or in a progressive design build. And the cost estimate should be owned by the builder um, instead of by the consulting engineer. And again, you need owners, staff that are strong technically and commercially to manage that cost and scope creep that we talked about in this model and progressive design build and also in uh, even in CM. And so the, the sweet spot for this one is well-defined project with cost complex delivery aspects, particularly Brownfield. And it's similar to the type of project models or type of project situations that the progressive design build was good for. The picture on the screen here is this is the first diverging diamond interchange in Canada. This is in Calgary on McLeod Trail at 162nd Avenue. And what you've got is 100,000 vehicles a day going left to right across the screen and 60,000 vehicles a day going the other way across the screen. Um, so you got 160,000 traffic movements a day and you're trying to build the structure uh, where there used to be signalized lights. and uh, the owner did something innovative here. They knew what the, what the bridge, what the end product looks like. So they actually issued an RFP at 70% design. And they said, here's the final product. How much is this going to cost to build and what innovations can you bring to it to help us do it? And what are some of the temporary works that we can implement to do this in a way that minimizes the impacts over two years for 160,000 vehicles a day. And they brought in Graham won the bid and uh the as we as as the team uh saved money on the job or added cost whatever the case it was, the price actually came down compared to our bid because of the collaboration that happened they just used a standard change order process to add or subtract from the contract that was signed and uh one of the accomplishments of the team on this job is that they had traffic signals in each direction they eliminated 
the traffic signals in the north south direction 100,000 vehicles a day they eliminated those traffic lights 12 months early on a 24 month construction schedule and you can imagine the cost benefit that brings to the traveling public in in not having to sit at five cycles of lights to get through a construction zone so the city of calgary has a lot of information online about this model they called it uh they, they use an rfp and they call it design assist and though if you look in the states for reference material it's the cmgc and city of edmonton calls it ccgc and they also talk publicly a lot you should be able to find papers online about uh or you can contact me and i can put you in touch with them and again it's the same types of projects the brownfield projects the complex projects multidisciplinary projects and complex building hospital renovations sport facility renovations and the like so the only difference between design assist ccgc cmgc and progressive design build this model has two separate contracts with the owner the contractor and the designer both have their own contract and progressive design build is just one one throat to choke if if needed so we'll go to ipd yeah ipd or integrated project delivery i uh this is this is the the, the newest delivery strategy that we're going to speak about um you know the, the key mechanics integrated team uh highly collaborative uh uh, on designing towards and designing towards an open book target price, uh, the project team members sign on to a multi-partner agreement uh, and set a risk reward percentages. So they agree the percentages within the contract and move forward from there. Uh, each company has a profit at risk with regards to any overruns, but kept whole on the costs and overheads. The owner carries overruns beyond the profit loss. Savings below the target price are then shared between the members of the team. Uh, based on the risk reward, uh, the risk reward percentage I spoke about earlier. So some of the positives with this is a very very collaborative model. I mean, obviously, I find it a little bit kind of it's 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 we're, <laughs> we're forcing collaboration in a way that everybody's got skin in the game, um, but it fosters real innovative approaches to the, to delivering the owner value. Uh, design is carried out to a targeted budget, uh, and it enables significant input for end users, sub trades, and, and OEMs. Uh, there's great transparency into the cost buildup of the different project elements and, and the individuals involved in that. But some of the negatives, um, design by committee, you know, when you've got so many, so many stakeholders involved, you know, it can result in, in scope cost and, and schedule creep. Uh, the validation phase can be, can be costly. Uh, there's many individual and individuals and the elements uh, for the design development of the design. So we need to make sure that we that the ample value creation is important to prove return on investment. We need to make sure that we're adding enough value on the front end of the of the project to to pay for to pay for that validation phase. Uh, and then more owner more owner resources are required early on in the project. And there's more stakeholders. So the sweet spot, uh, I would say. Projects in which input from end users, subtrades, OEMs, as I mentioned earlier, it's basically specialist uh, input is a critical factor to the success, uh, successful, uh, success of the outcome. Uh, and then particularly, it's very useful in subcontracted constru uh, construction sectors, buildings and uh, public facilities. I wouldn't use it uh, when the design and scope has already been developed or a typical and already understood. I mean, I mean, Brian can give a couple of examples of some wastewater treatment uh, facilities where we didn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that that was the, uh, the right use of the delivery, uh, and and also maybe not use it when depending on the complexity of the project, uh, the, you know the schedule obviously needs to allow significant front end work. Awesome. Two thoughts about IPD. One is that Andrew talked about the multi-party agreement, and so what you've got is you've got the owner saying, "I'll take forty percent of the risk reward." Uh, the construction contractor says, I'll take 50% of the risk reward and the designer might say, I'll take 10%. But if you're building a facility that really l lends itself to sub trades getting involved, a building that has some particularly unique finishes uh, that you need that the a main or maybe a main mechanical contract, you're building a hockey rink and the team that's supplying the ammonia refrigeration system wants to be involved in how that's designed and implemented into the building or something like that. Um, you can add them as a fourth party to that multi-partner agreement. They could take 5% of the risk reward. And so what happens is you're encouraging everybody to work together to kind of 
bring that project in below the target price so there's extra money to share and you're working towards a profit and unfortunately the owner uh, has to manage it or the uh, overpay if you go over budget and all the profit fee is consumed then the owner has to pay for that and uh, I had a second point about uh, IPD but it escapes me I think what I was going to say is the tools that we hear about in IPD, the big room and the lean construction engineering, all of those tools can be used in any other any of the other contract models. If you need a big meeting in a construction management and you want to call it the big room and you're going to work on a particular problem, you're actually borrowing from IPD philosophy, lean construction philosophy, and, and bringing it to your construction management model. And so you shouldn't be using IPD just because you like the tools that are in there. They are transferable to all the other project models. And really, it's about improving that communication and the, the thing that Andrew said about this is where end user input is really important. Um, water treatment is kind of a gray area because some plant operators know what they want and some don't. But when you're designing a hospital and you got to figure out where does the floor drain have to be in the operating room? Where does the surgeon need the sinks? And what kind of communications link ups do we need in there? Or in a courthouse, what is the, what is the back of house staff who are helping run the courthouse, what do they need in the way that the building is set up to separate the public from the secure areas? And if you're designing a hockey arena, swimming pool, multiplex, what are the end user experiences that the public is seeking for the taxpayer money that's being used? So where end user input is, is really important, and that was one of the things that we had on that, on that graph, the degree of end user input, uh, when it's high, it really lends itself to an IPD. I think that's a great point there, Brian, that, that a, lot of the, a lot of the tools, the lean tools used in IPD really are transferable to, 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 to most other delivery strategies. Agreed. So the last one is alliance, and there's a lot written on the screen here. I'm going to tell you the right time to use an alliance is when the owner, when the owner is having trouble attracting bidders to the job because the project is so hard to define or the risks are so hard to define that no one wants to bid on the job. Because what's happening in an alliance is the owner is allowing the designer and the contractor to come in and they're working in a, in a risk-free, blame-free culture to develop the design and, and do the price. And the owner is saying, you know, this is a quality-driven project. This is not a cost-driven project. And, and that'll show up in the result. And you're paying a premium to have the A-team from the designer and the contractor in that tent with the owner to de-risk this problem, whatever is needed for an alliance. And we see a lot of projects going to alliance now where, I'll say it, uh, the owner is giving too much away to the, to the, to the construction sector. Um, you're in a situation, you know, you got to evaluate your market. Are you in a market where there's a lot of bidders? Is the project well-defined that you can design it and put it out to a bid build? Or do you need some involvement with the designer that you want to do it? Uh, design assist or progressive design build do you have to go all the way to the alliance and give away the farm as i call it as an owner and i worked for an owner for 10 years uh to to make your project successful and so the mechanics of an alliance is you have one or two bidders and they kind of propose people process and product the pricing might not even be evaluated um in, in New Zealand, again, I'll draw on that example. They have two envelopes. They have two bids. They do a competitive alignment, alliance, and they get two bids, and they, they check the technical, and they say yes, and they pick the winner based on technical, and they say, we're going to go with this company. Then they open the price envelope, and if the price is below the owner's budget, they say, this team wins. They do not even look at the price of the second bidder. They just, if this one's below budget or within the budget, that team won based on their technical proposal. Um, so the nice thing about this approach is that an alliance board is established with senior people from the, the owner, the contractor, and, and the designer. And they are put in place to kind of establish what behaviors do we need and what key performance indicators are we going to use to encourage those behaviors. So the shared risk reward is usually pre-divined by the owner. The owner says, this is what, I, this, you know, I'm going to give you 13% profit, Mr. Contractor. Uh, these things are usually pre-defined. And any loss by the designer or the contractor is usually capped at profit only. And the owner will take the overrun over that. Um, 
So suitable for major programs when risks are too high or difficult to define, this addresses a lack of bidders scenario. A great example in Toronto is Union Station, just a really complex, difficult project. Not the Union Station work that's been done to date, but the reconfiguration of the lines coming into Union Station, which is starting now. They just signed the contract uh, last month. Uh, that's a great example of alliance where there wouldn't have been a lot of bidders lining up for that, for the potential uh, pain that a contractor could incur on a job like that. So you can do it competitively as a, you know, New Zealand uses two bidders and, uh, or you can do a qualifications based selection and you, you can use it to hire a design build team, or you can use it just to add a contractor to an existing owner design team. So the competitive alliance kind of lacks that three-party collaboration because it's it's kind of like a design build where you got two teams racking their brains out on figuring out what the owner wants and uh, proposing their, their design. And uh, in British Columbia, they've introduced both progressive design build and also alliance. And one of the things that was happening in British Columbia is they were having trouble attracting bidders to their hospital projects because the costs of bidding the projects in a market that's overheated were so high that contractors, you know, didn't have the motivation to participate in those procurements. And so, you know, the, the uh, stakeholders there in the British Columbia government and infrastructure BC said, let's make it easier for them to participate in the bids and let's run with competitive alliance or uh, progressive design bill where the bid costs are lower. And so I'll make the point later, but you want to evaluate what's your market situation like when you're designing, I talked about choosing your contract model based on risks and market conditions is one of, is one of the uh, things to be assessed. It is really difficult in an alliance, and I'll draw back to New Zealand, to change traditional behaviors because you take a person who's been doing design build and they've been really hard on their design builder for 20 years and all of a sudden you drop them into an alliance, you're not allowed to uh, strangle throats anymore. You gotta work with these people to get the outcomes that you want on the job. It's a no blame culture. And uh, of course here the owner is at risk for those cost overruns. And so the sweet spot, as I said, is when, when you can't get bidders because the risk profile is so high or even the risk profile is unknown. And a larger program, you know, we hear about it often in the oil sands in Alberta where they have an alliance to do the maintenance at Syncrude. They spend, you know, two to $3 billion a year doing maintenance at those facilities. And they put together an alliance team where what happens over time is that the cost of engineering and the cost of construction execution actually comes down over time because of the team collaboration and growing as one and the understanding of the, the, the needs and preferences of the owner team and how to get things done becomes more familiar over time. So those are the five contract models we wanted to feature under the collaborative contract model umbrella. And if you have any questions about those, you can reach out to Natalie and Andrew and I. And, and now for the last uh, five minutes, we're just going to talk about uh, maintaining competitive tension. Um, up until now, this, this presentation has been made about 80 times across Canada to governments uh, and private owners all across the country. And everybody nods and they say, it's nice, but how do you avoid getting ripped off? by your construction contractor when you're doing qualifications based selection, hiring a contractor when there's nothing to bid on, you're just looking at their qualifications. And so we actually encourage owners to incorporate commercial elements into the bid, even if like, like we think of that uh, divergent diamond example where they, they had the final design and they said, what's the price for this? Uh, at a 70% design and, and they evaluated it. It was actually evaluated on a 50-50. And in Graham's experience, 50-50 still comes down to price. And so if you really wanna differentiate, they're building a cancer hospital in Alberta, $1.4 billion budget. It was 80% qualifications and 20% price. And everybody is thrilled with the outcomes on that hospital here in Calgary. And if you really wanna find the best contractor to do the job, uh, go heavy on quals and some of the commercial elements that you can figure out is what is your profit going to be on the job or what is your CM fee going to be on your job? What overheads are you going to take for the general conditions? How much is it going to cost if the schedule is two years for you to manage the job, your, your indirects, your trailer rentals and your, your, your project overhead, how, how much will that cost? And you know, what, it's funny, I say this, what uh, effort are you gonna put into the ECI phase? Graham actually lost a job because we bid too high for the ECI phase. The owner took the bidder that bid less for the collaborative phase. 
um, kind of looking at it like a consulting scenario, but it's like anything. You get what you pay for. Graham was going to put in all the best people we had and build a team of eight people. And we had promised to deliver a $13 million savings. The owner never evaluated how much savings was going to be created. They just looked at how much are they charging us for the collaborative phase and made their decision that way. And at the end of the day, that project actually ran over budget um, by, by, by selecting the wrong contractor. Uh, and I'm, I'm not biased when I say that. And the uh, uh, capping the price growth, which may occur between the indicative bid and the final contract value. On that diverging diamond in Calgary, what the owner didn't protect themselves against was if the, the budget was $70 million, if somebody bid a garbage bid at $30 million, the calculation of the 50-50 evaluation of price and technical would have favored that contractor who bid 30 million. They get in to do the optimization of the design and they say, oops, it's actually 70 million. And they, they obviously played a game to win the job. The owner should have a cap on how much that growth can be with an off-ramp to not proceed with that contract if you get that kind of situation. And the biggest suggestion we have on qualification-based selection is use key performance indicators during the collaborative phase to evaluate the contractor's suitability for execution. Could you actually consider a bonus or a penalty to their fee? Uh, meeting expectations, you're going to get your fee. If you exceed expectations during the collaboration phase, we're going to give you 0.5 percentage points on your fee or 1% more. And if you're really poor, we're going to give you a penalty and subtract from your fee or even take the off ramp and not work with you. Uh, hold the contractor's feet to the fire to get what they promised in the qualifications based selection. So use some use some owner tools in execution to do that and kind of incentivize the job with gain share or pain share with a cap before the final price is delivered. And then the last couple of slides that I have here, uh, the elephant in the room with qualifications based selection is uh, uh, the potential for the processes to be abused, to be corrupted. And we kind of address that in this slide, only involve owner organizations, uh, designers and contractors that have strong management systems and they must have a whistleblower program. Separate the evaluation duties to, eval to lower the influence of a single person's opinion in evaluating the qualitative bids. Share the scoring data with the evaluation team and, the, and a process auditor. And by sharing, you know, what did, he, what did so-and-so score on the, what did she score? And then by sharing that, you're fostering objectivity because somebody on that team is going to see a problem uh, in the scoring results, they're going to see bias if they share everybody's scores. So foster objectivity and also seek out anomalies when you're looking at that data. Mandate bitter debriefs with scoring data shared. So uh, we don't mind participating in, in quality-based selection. We actually prefer it because the cost to play is lower because we don't have to make an estimate. We don't have to spend $300,000 doing an estimate for the job. Um, so we, we do like to have that bitter debrief. Use a fairness advisor, which makes sure everybody gets the same information. Use independent oversight, uh, some kind of uh, auditor who has transparency into all the communications. Maybe even consider outsourcing the management of the evaluation process. And always use an owner's vendor management system. It's surprising to us as contractors how many times you ask an owner, uh, have you been keeping track of how your contractors have performed over the years? Do you know which contractors caused the price to go up? without due cause, you know, like just uh, inflation that the owner didn't think was justified through change orders. And most of the owners tell us, no, we're not tracking that kind of stuff. And so an owner needs a vendor management system. And when we look to the legal system, we do say there needs to be larger penalties for fraud for, uh, you know, corruptive practices in, uh, in Canada. And we'll wrap up here. Uh, Graham's procurement tips for owners, always connect a collaborative contracting opportunity to the construction opportunity. Construction companies do not make money having their people be construction consultants. They want the strings attached to the construction because the business model is based on a uh, senior project manager running 150 people in the field. That's how the model is, is based. It's not like a consulting company where it's 3.0 multipliers and, and that pays for the overheads and profit. Uh, always use open book cost estimating in your in your uh, collaborative contracts. We do encourage qualifications based selection and you need to find a way to make sure that owner gives you the A team and by connecting 
the construction to the collaboration opportunity, you're going to get the A team. Use the vendor performance management system. And I talked about it. One of our favorite things to talk about offline is post financing of bids, but we won't cover it now. So in conclusion, ECI contractors, contract models, collaborative contract models result in better projects because of earlier three-party collaboration and better communications. However, the projects, collaborative projects are challenging, more costly to the owner and the right type of people who are good interpersonal skills and good technical construction and engineering people, the right type of people are in short supply. So you can't do every project as a collaborative contract because there's not enough people to go around to do it properly. Use collaborative contract models where you can demonstrate a return on effort, a return on investment. Use the right contractor mo contract procurement model based on the risks and opportunities in the project and consider the market conditions that you're going to in your market. Toronto has a very hot market. And, and so what can you do to encourage more of the better bidders to work on your jobs? The owner has flexibility and influence. I always say owner makes the rules so you can get creative in your procurement. Organizations need to be ready for collaborative contracting, not just the mindset of how you're going to behave in that environment, but also the maturity and management systems that we talked about to manage a QBS system. And then the last one is a, is a poke for Graham, is that not all construction contractors are created equally. So that's, uh, that's our presentation, and we'll turn it over to John for questions. Thank you, Brian. And... Uh, in fact, thank you all, Natalie and, and Andrew. Uh, we've got uh, a few questions to get us started. Uh, again, just a reminder, uh, we would welcome questions. The first one comes from Ronan, and Ronan, with your permission, I'm going to divide this a little bit. It's a terrific question, uh, and maybe, Brian, we'll start with you. Uh, Andrew and Natalie may want to weigh in on it. But it's around the notion that uh, we've been talking about collaborative methodology, early contractor involvement uh, must pay a return on investment. Those decisions separate value, the, the, the notion that value and price are synonymous. It kind of talks about uh, the value of, of uh, a contract methodology that is other than design bid build. And when we're talking about the public sector, it's much more difficult to rationalize for a bunch of reasons. One, um, they, they uh, are bound by legislation that forces them to use, uh, to be transparent and, and, to, and to guarantee best value. And, and if it's low price in a bid scenario, that's easy to rationalize. But when we start talking about newer collaborative methodologies, we are told by municipalities they have trouble. They rationalize an IPD project, for example, as a pilot project instead of something they can, they can rationalize under their restrictions. So how do we persuade public buyers of construction, specifically the municipalities say, that uh, using a methodology other than design, bid, build, uh, can uh, can be rationalized uh, uh, by that municipality, by the politicians specifically, the councils that have to approve them. How do you make that pitch to a municipality? I think the starting point is to ask that municipality, are they happy with how their projects are going so far? And, you know, the stats in Canada are that two thirds of all projects run over budget or over schedule. So is the municipality getting what they want out of their procurement processes? And uh, if not, you know, the industry needs to celebrate the successes of the collaborative contract models that are coming out. And in order to prove value, you need to track that return on investment. And after the job is done, you can be transparent with the, with the taxpayers and say it costs this much more to do the job whatever X is to bring in that contractor earlier, but these are the results that we generated. And so you kind of need a champion at your municipality to bring this forward. I, I do like the idea of piloting it, maybe not on your most significant project the first, don't do it on your $130 million swimming pool on your first try um, because they are difficult to implement. 
And uh, if they want to call them pilot projects, I think that's a way to satiate the, the voting public is that, yes, we are trying something new. Um, but I think it starts with, are you getting, are you happy with what you're getting? Are, are, the, are the results on your projects satisfactory or, or do you need to do something different? Andrew, do you want to add some thoughts to that? Your experience uh, at Graham dealing specifically with public buyers of construction when you're trying to move them away from the design bid build model? Uh, <clears throat> I would you know, really just to, again, just to highlight what Brian said, I think that that open transparency of, you know, how, how have our projects, you know, succeeded, you know, what, you know, what was the end result of the projects that we, that we, that, 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 you know, that the public sector uh, has, has delivered and, 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 and being open about that. And, 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 you know, if, <laughs> You know, as we all know, the definition of madness is to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. So, you know, be open and, and, and those, those pilot projects, you know, again, lessons learned, be open about those. Did, were, they, you know, were they successful or, or not? Natalie, um, most of your recent experience has been in uh, P3, in the P3 model. Uh, and, and that's a very different model for public buyers to rationalize, and it's had some success. Anything you can add, and, and I'm thinking more about uh, projects not procured under the P3 uh, model, uh, anything that, that you've gleaned from your experience on P3s that you can share with uh, attendees that would help them rationalize going away from design bid build when they're looking at, at new projects that are procured uh, other than P3. Is Natalie uh, dropped off? I don't see her on the panel. Yeah, I think she just may be having some connection issues, so she might join us again. Okay. You can join us in a sec. Uh, now, uh, back to you, Brian. I want to move to uh, kind of the second part of that uh, question. What would you consider the most beneficial buckets of risk when an owner can spend money on up, uh, up front uh, to clarify or better understand uh, the advantages of early project uh, involvement? Two of the things that really drag projects down once they get going is uh, utilities, uh, I guess un uh, unknown ground conditions, whether it's utilities or a geotechnical baseline for some linear scope of work. Uh, that's the one issue. And the second issue is kind of stakeholder management, uh, surprises to contractors or, you know, the contractors weren't involved in making those commitments. The owner has made commitments to stakeholders of what the contractor will or won't do. And the contractor might have trouble staffing those. And so two of the things owners can do is really get your uh, stakeholder management done early. And I'm talking one to two years early and, you know, do a phone some contractors and say, what kind of information do you need in this location about the utilities or the geotechnical conditions or the contamination? And we're seeing a lot of archaeological delays on projects as well. So try to get all that done years in advance of when you're ready to do your project. Yeah. Anything you want to add, Andrew? Just, uh, I was going to, I did read this question a little earlier and, and that was going to be kind of my, my answer to that. I think the, the, the earlier you can engage the stakeholders, the better. It's, it's interesting. The, uh, the timing uh, is particularly good, I think, to have a constructive conversation. I'm sticking now with public buyers still for a moment. Most of the work that's being procured around the country these days that isn't, uh, say, high-rise condo or residential is... is, is uh, uh, still public buyers of construction. Um, and, you know, when I used to have this conversation with my late father, he used to argue that design bid build made the most sense, all things being equal. And uh, sadly, all things are never equal anymore. So uh, thank God there's a willingness to embrace some of these new methodologies to look at, at procuring construction a different way than we have historically. But to what degree do you think um, this changing landscape has helped us have a constructive conversation with public buyers? And by changing landscape, I'm not talking 
specifically about COVID, al although some of the things happened as a consequence, but the labor shortage uh, across the country, the uh, price volatility, the inability to lock down numbers, the, the need sometimes for indexed contracts if you're in a lump sum format because you just can't price something that's so volatile these days. You know, delivery of a container from China here that was once 2,500 is now 25,000 and more. Uh, do you find that that changing landscape is making it easier to have conversations with public buyers? I think people are realizing their projects aren't successful. I think uh, the changing landscape is, is, is important to say there are other ways to do things and it's important for those first runners to share their results. And I'll, I'll say it, John, one of the experiences that owners are having with collaborative contract models is kind of the sticker shock. They're getting a surprise in the collaborative process. I've let the contractor in earlier, the price is too high. And uh, what's actually happening there is they're getting the realistic cost estimating that they're not getting from their consulting. You know, I have all the respect in the world for consulting engineers, but it's, it's what I talked about, the three reasons for difference in cost estimating. The prices are coming in higher uh, than expected. And it's kind of a reality check. And some owners are, are rejecting it, saying the collaborative process is being abused by the contractors. And I think uh, it's important to get the good news stories out there and help owners uh, feel comfortable in, in trying these new things. And it's associations like the Toronto Construction Association, by putting on sessions like this, I'll say it, John, there's a lack of information in the market about collaborative contracting, which model to use, how to do it. So the procurement people and the lawyers, the legal people and the finance people, they're all uncertain. Um, and so they default back to what they know, their comfort zone, which is the, 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 the bid build and the, uh, and the design build. So I, I'd say yes, that as prices go up and as labor is short and as we exist in hot markets like Toronto and Vancouver, uh, there has to be some thought. I mean, there is some thought. How can we do this differently or better? As we see with Infrastructure BC introducing progressive design build and uh, competitive alliance and, and uh, Infrastructure Ontario and Metrolinks using alliance. Uh, you know, some people are, are being the case studies for the rest of uh, industry. And we got to share the good news stories and remind people why uh, the various results are occurring as we go and, and the TCA and, uh, and your peers all have a role to play in, in getting out the good news story. Again, our thanks to Ronan for a particularly good question. Uh, uh, Rushang had a question related to IPD and is trying to better understand how the initial uh, budget uh, is prepared and the process that owners would typically go through to arrive at a budget that makes any sense. Your thoughts on that? Maybe elaborate a little bit. It, it's maybe good, I, John. Andrew, go ahead. Maybe I can answer that one. So in, in, in my experience or our experience uh, here at Graham, um, usually the, the, owner, the owner has established a budget uh, by, you know, with the help of a, of a third party uh, independent cost consultant. Uh, and, then, and then from there, when the IPD uh, team is engaged, um, you know, the IPD then uh, team begins to validate that number. So validate it against the market and, and, and with a lot of substrate uh, uh, input as well, because obviously there's a lot of uh, subcontractors that are, that, are, that are part of that IPD team. So we validate the budget that the third party cost consultant has put together. And then once we do that, we would move into uh, target value design, where we then design design the project to that, to that target budget and, and try and, Try and encapsulate as much added value as we can during that process. So, Andrew, just so I'm clear, uh, owner prepares a budget. Uh, the, the initial first step in a collaborative methodology or, or anything that involves early contractor involvement is or engagement is to validate that the, the, the contract or the, the budget itself makes sense try to get some clarity around uh, uh, scope ambiguity whenever it's unclear and presumably identify some of the vulnerabilities that would drive that cost up. And that's not just true of IPD, that's true of anything collaborative, presumably. 
Yeah, exactly, John. Uh, thank you, Rasheng, for your question. Uh, a couple of questions from Anishka. First is, uh, what is the place uh, uh, pro project uh, budgeting in all those contract methodologies, which, uh, which is the top priority uh, in a project uh, uh, going from project to uh, concept to project delivery? Uh, little clarification, Anushka, just on the, your focus is on the, uh, the budgeting and how that works in presumably collaborative contracts. But it's, uh, maybe you can just speak to that. It's obviously a process, not an event. Andrew, as you develop uh, a budget, it, it isn't something you set in stone. It's something you work collaboratively towards keeping current. That's right, but you can set that budget. Uh, I think the biggest factor to the person's question between going from feasibility to execution or from pre-design to execution is is uh, is the discussion of risk. It's uh, you know um, there's three ways that construction companies make profit. One is they add ten percent profit to their bid. The second way is they uh, uh, execute the work more productively than what they estimated in their budget. So whereas they thought this might take six months to do this and it takes four months, they take the costs for the two months and they put it in their pocket as profit. So that's the second way they make money. And the third way they make money is risk contingency with a risk that is either mitigated or doesn't materialize. And then that's also money in their pocket. And so you have to understand that when you go from the cost of building that bridge or hospital or, you know, what are the risks associated with executing it? And uh, how can the owner use those third party cost consultants and uh, your design engineers to help understand what are some of the typical contingencies that go on a job for this and this risk and understanding the heat of your market, the temperature of your environment is, is part of evaluating those risks. So that's, that's one of the reality checks. And something we encourage, John, is if you're contemplating a big project and whatever big is in your world, do a market sounding uh, where you can ask contractors difficult questions. So you can do it as an owner or you can do it through a management consultant where you identify five contractors who you think might bid on your job or who you want to bid on your job and put together some difficult questions because in life there are no dumb questions. Uh, ask them of the contractors and you will be surprised and uh, grateful for the answers that you get back which help you think a different way about your project and then bring some reality to how you're going to go from concept uh, uh, pre-design to execution. Thank you. Quick question, uh, just a follow-up question. Uh, and this is again from Anushka and it's, it, the context is the role of a QS. Now I know historically uh, owners have involved QSs in developing their initial project budgets before they make typically procurement decisions. Uh, QS has a role historically as a project monitor approving, you know, monthly progress draws and whatever, but what is the QS's role uh, in the early stages and, and ongoing in some of these collaborative methodologies? Andrew, you want to take that first? Yeah, I could just, you know, similar to what I said earlier that that you know early on that budget is usually you know put together by that by the QS uh, with the client and then throughout that collaborative process we're going to kind of reiterations of that budget are going to are going to move forward with with the with the you know whether it be an IPD team or or, or, or the overall project team uh, and then aligning it with with that QS so that so that you know we it's a it's a back check you know in, in essence so that so that you know we work together collaboratively you know, uh, and make sure that, you know, we have a baseline and, and, and that those budgets are aligned. I think the role, I agree, Andrew, and I think the role of the quantity surveyor in the early stages, really, you should really tap into those, th that team's knowledge, the quantity surveyor's knowledge about contract models. As we spoke here, there's not a lot of this stuff out in the market. And yet in England, in the United Kingdom, quantity surveying is a study at college, at university, uh, where they're talking about what we're talking about today. And they can come to your project with different ideas about how to get it done in those early stages. So your contract model should be part of the early discussion, not just the design features and the budget, but how are we going to procure this? And your quantity surveyor 
can play an important role. The most successful projects ever done in the oil sands, you know, where they spend, you know, $500 billion. It was a quantity surveyor who made the difference on, on one particular program uh, where all the projects came in early and under budget. And it was because of the contract model that they advocated for. Well, when we go back and look at the, uh, the, the UK as an example, and you talked about New Zealand and other countries, the US being way ahead of us in terms of embracing some of these collaborative methodologies. We've, we've had very few projects using Alliance, uh, relatively few using IPD, nothing like what we've seen in the States. And they've moved well beyond the model and, and nuanced it and improved it in countries like New Zealand and UK. In the UK, the old British master builder system, that, that kind of quantities and, and unit rates approach to construction, I, I actually think as, as the uh, technology improves and we can rely on, uh, say, a BIM design that more accurately give us actual quantities, uh, we could see a return to that a little bit. And, uh, and maybe there will be a greater role going forward for QSs or QS involvement with contractors as we become more sophisticated. I want to move in a different direction with a, a question and we're running out of time, but Brian, you talked about a couple of these collaborative methodologies involving uh, transparency and, and the underlying issue is trust. Contractor is dealing with a buyer of construction uh, on kind of an open book basis. They're talking about the case, the example used in one methodology was at say a 13% profit expectation, although that's a vulnerable number and at risk, but uh, disclosing uh, for your client what your real costs are, what your, how you work up your labor costs and how you, uh, how you illustrate to a client that what they're looking at are real costs and develop a real trust that can allow us to move forward because without trust, collaborative methodologies don't work. Now at Graham, you've been uh, pretty successful, I think, at establishing that trust. Any advice for us related to opening our books and becoming more transparent as we move to more collaborative methodologies? I think, uh, I think owner organizations need to look at construction contractors as as another professional service and uh, just realized that uh, just like an engineering consulting company makes profits based on their multipliers, that construction companies earn their profits through delivering professional construction services um, in terms of, uh, um, you know, it's tied to what their rates are, but it's also tied to their productivity. And, and the owner needs to realize that I need to make that contractor's job as easy as possible for them to do what they do as professionals. And so it takes a mind shift, I think, John, in the, in the owner's sense and less so on the contractor side. And I, and I, my advice to contractors is just to remind your owners that, uh, um, you know, you're just, you're just a business person trying, trying to run your business and you're not, you're not, a, you're not, uh, you're not, uh, you're not out there to rip people off and just try to humanize the experience between those two parties is, is my advice. Thank you, Brian. Uh, just a quick question. Is Natalie back on? I am. Sorry, John. Yes. Hi, Natalie. No problem. Uh, any final comments? Uh, I know in your experience in the P3 world, um, I mean, that's kind of in, in some ways was our first move uh, into real collaboration when we developed that model in, in all provinces across Canada. Any advice about Anything you can point out related to those that have been most successful by being upfront and honest and open book to overcome the, the, the perception that contractors work. You know, our experience in a prescriptive design bid build model is everything's confrontational. We keep our, we, we bogart uh, everything about everything. Any final comments before we close? I think, you know, my final comments would just be, you know, you touched on it earlier, John, with just some of the um, the issues that we're facing in the market right now with escalation and labor shortages and the risk that contractors are going to have to carry when you go with a design bid build model or a design build model. 
are going to raise a, a lot of costs. And I think going with a more collaborative, open book um, model will help owners understand what some of those risks are and how to share those risks as we go through these turbulent times that are coming up. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, it is uh, 12.30 and, and like any anybody with a construction uh, background, we like to stick to schedule. Uh, so I'll, I'll take a few moments now to close out. Just before I do, uh, and I, I would ask people to stay with me just for a moment because we have a big thank you here. Uh, but I want to give you a heads up. Our next uh, seminar in the series is environmental. It's April 6th at 11, uh, same time, same channel. Uh, the topic is the emerging regulatory framework for decarbonization in the building sector with a look at the city of Toronto's net zero, net zero existing building strategy. So something that uh, many of you will benefit from. Uh, and these, uh, these seminars have been very insightful and I can't think of any that have been any better than this. And that is because we have the right three people uh, today. So a real thank you to Brian, Natalie, and Andrew. It's interesting because today we've been talking about collaboration and, and, and the notion of working collaboratively with our, with our clients and with uh, the design team. But what I find most interesting about today's topic is uh, uh, Brian and Natalie and Andrew, your willingness uh, to be so open and share insights uh, for the benefit of all. And, and uh, you have no idea how grateful we are for that. Um, I know our industry hasn't always worked collaboratively internally with each other. And uh, one of the things that's happened in recent years is we've all uh, agreed to work collaboratively in, with anything to do with safety for the greater good of the industry. And now, uh, to see Graham and the three of you specifically so honest and open and insightful and sharing some of the things that help us as an industry better communicate with buyers of construction has been absolutely invaluable. I can't thank the three of you enough. I've had the benefit of hearing Brian now three times, but uh, Natalie and Andrew you've provided enormous insight and I think we're better for having both of you involved. So uh, on behalf of all of us, and there are a couple of hundred of us that have enjoyed um, your talk today, uh, I, I can't think that there would be anybody on this call that hasn't uh, gleaned uh, some insight that they didn't have uh, an hour and a half ago. So I want to thank you very much uh, for making yourselves available today and, and for for being so candid. Uh, it's been a wonderful 90 minutes. Thank and, you very uh, much. Thank you very much, John. We've loved the opportunity. It's a privileged audience and we're just thrilled to be able to, to do this with you. Well, yeah. we're enormously grateful. So thanks guys, uh, uh, all of you. And uh, thanks to our team at TCA for doing that. We're going to continue the seminar series. I know uh, Susanna and her team are working to bring those more frequently. We love the benefit. We love seeing a couple of hundred people sign on and, uh, and we've all learned something from you folks today. So thank you very much. And I'll give us all a chance to get back to our day job. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Take care.